All right. Well, I think everybody that's coming is coming. So I'm going to go if you'd like to go ahead and get started. Yeah, for sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jody. I am here to talk to you about Japan, obviously, to talk about some things for your trip. Um, why I'm qualified to do this. So I lived in Japan for four years through the JET program. I was teaching English at a high school there. I was in a place called Miyazaki Prefecture or Miyazaki Ken, and I was in Hyuga City. So just the map to show you where I was, a um, couple pictures of the interesting things around Miyazaki. So we have really pretty falls, some waterfalls, some weird festivals. Um, I was in what was technically a city, but it was more like a bunch of towns in a trench coat pretending to be a city. They were sort of all squished together. Um, it was also the second poorest prefecture in Japan. So that impacted things like the technology that my students had, um, some of the lifestyles, also family structure occasionally. So it was different than you'd see in Tokyo for sure, or even in the bigger cities like Hiroshima or Osaka. Just a couple nerdy favorite things that I enjoyed. Um, I really liked looking at castles. I'm a history nerd, so castles are very cool, and there's a lot of them in Japan. There's a lot of original castles still available. Um, I really like rhythm video games, so I liked going to the um, the arcades a lot. I played, I did taiko. I was part of a taiko team, so traditional drumming, and there happens to be a video game for that too, so that was fun. Uh, the picture is me and one of my friend's kids competing and she absolutely wiped the floor with me. Wow. Other things that were fun, sushi. I'm sure you are familiar with sushi. It's really cheap in Japan and because there's so much coast, it also tends to be pretty fresh. I There was a conveyor belt sushi place on the way home from my job. So I would often stop there for dinner and get like $10 worth of sushi and that would last me two meals. So that was super cool. So a little bit about being a high schooler in Japan. I don't know if you're doing any kind of homestay when you're in Japan or if you're going to be interacting with high schoolers, but high school looks a little bit different in Japan than it does in the U.S. First off, you're not automatically kind of tracked into a school based on your location. Instead, you have to apply for a school. At the end of junior high, so at the end of your ninth grade year, you would take an entrance exam to one school that you're trying to get into. It, it varies a little from prefecture from state to state, but for the most part, you can only take one test. And so if you don't get into that school, you're a little bit out of luck. So this leads people not necessarily to shoot as high as they might. Uh, they tend to take tests that they know they can pass. But there's a couple different kinds of schools. So we have at the top is academic, then commercial, which is where I was, technical, agricultural, fishing, and then special needs. There tends to be a couple special needs high schools throughout the prefecture. We had only one fishing high school, but it was really cool. They took a, every year they took a boat to Hawaii from Japan and they fished along the way. And then they did a cool exchange while they were in Hawaii and then they fished on their way back. Um, Yep. How it was, long is that boat ride? <laughs> I think that was about two months. I oh, think the wow. whole trip, I take that back, I think the whole trip was three months. So they would be gone and then they'd take the boat and they'd be working on the boat throughout the entire time, along with qualified fishermen. But they were like, had to do all the different jobs on the boat too. Mm. And then they'd be in Hawaii for two weeks and then they'd turn around and come back. Wow. Yeah, and then every year at the school festival, they would also hand out fish that they had caught. So like they, part of the test in the school was learning how to properly uh, butcher a fish or prepare a fish, I guess. And so there'd be really good like yellowfin tuna that you could go get if you just went to the school festival. Wow. So uh, other things about high school, it's divided into homerooms that you stay with all three years of high school. So if you don't like the kids in your class, you're a little bit out of luck. Mm -hmm. um, but if you like them, that's great. You're gonna be spending a lot of time with them. The calendar also looks a little bit different. So Japanese school starts in April and it goes until March. March is the end of the year. 
they do this in accordance with like the cherry blossom festival or cherry blossom season because cherry blossoms are all about um they've got a lot of symbolism in japan about youth and their time like only available for a short period so everything is a little bit shifted in japan so starts with the opening ceremony for the school year it's just a big assembly um they introduce all the new the first year students come in um, they take their place behind the senior students and there's a little bit of ceremony with that the principal gives a speech um, and announces all of the homeroom teacher assignments because that'll change from year to year then there's the school festival which tip for my school happened in the fall but it changes from school to school it was a really cool time where each homeroom did something different so there were a bunch of students in like the business track and they all had to make businesses for the school festival so they might sell flowers or they might make their own crafts to sell uh, a lot of times they would sell produce and baked goods and then they get to take that money and it gets it's a competition between homerooms but they also can get to invest it back in their own little businesses that they're running on the side there's also a lot of performances so there's drumming the third year students so the senior students all do little plays um, that they've all written and practiced themselves. And it's about a three day event that goes on and it's open to the community as well as just the high school. Okay, I was, I've was i always wondered about that because in the dramas and movies that I've watched from that's based in Japan, the Japanese dramas, uh, that, was, that was always one of the things that they always do. They always highlight the school festival and I was like, do they really do that? So yeah, okay, you just confirmed something for me. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. It's it's a huge thing too. Uh, sometimes my students would make, they would turn, so we had different tracks, which I'll talk about in a second, but the, the home ec track would sometimes turn the library into like a little kid's carnival. Mm -hmm. So that like for, it was like for five and under, people would bring their kids and the, the home ec track students would make little games like they made a vending machine out of cardboard boxes that then actually dropped out toys and like little trinkets. So they put a lot of work into this. Um, I know some schools have done whole haunted houses. They've like set up multiple classrooms to be haunted houses. It's a whole time, it's a huge time to display your homeroom's ability to work together, but also what you're doing in your club. So the tea ceremony club would be selling tickets to come have join the tea ceremony, um, the kendo club or the, the judo club might put on a performance. So it was a really cool time. And it was also just a little bit of a nice break from the normal academic schedule because these students are typically at school every single day. So Monday through Friday is normal school hours plus club activities after school. So you, you'd probably be at school from seven until seven or eight at night. And then on the weekends, you're probably going to come in for at least half a day on Saturday and Sunday for your club activity. Also, more than likely, you're only going to be in one club. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not, not on board with that. One day. <laughs> yeah, my daughter's in eight different clubs. <laughs> so she has to juggle which one she actually wants to go to throughout the week so yeah. <laughs> that, yeah so i was i was a similar way in high school too like i especially when i had sports and theater when they both need a lot of time mm -hmm. uh there was no way i would have been able to to the level at least my high school you had one sport per season so there were a couple you'd probably do a couple different sports throughout the year um so my students chose one on sport and that, that is all they had and they practiced year round oh, okay. so other thing <laughs> any any questions about club though also because it's please feel free to interrupt me if you have questions any questions about clubs no. <laughs> okay no <laughs> fair um so other things were the class math matches uh twice a year so once a semester we would have class sports days, basically, where each homeroom would compete in a couple different activities. It was divided, boys and girls. Japan is still very 
much on the binary gender divide. Mm -hmm. So boys had a certain amount, certain number of events they'd compete in while the girls would do a different set of events. And depending on the season, it might be dodgeball outside or soccer or rugby or inside we'd have basketball um, and sometimes badminton as well. Then there was the sports festival, which was like a big color war. I don't know if you've ever done color war. Um, I did it a lot at camp growing up, but the homerooms would be divided into one of four colors. And then it was a long, like it was a full day event, but we would practice for it. My students would spend hours practicing marching in formation around the, the sports field. Um, so there were a lot of issues sometimes with overheating. So also because you're going to be there in the summer, just make sure you're drinking a lot of water because it gets gross. Uh, Japan, at least the part I was in, is subtropical. So it is very humid. But in this area, we get a similar weather, so it shouldn't be that bad. But there's a lot less air conditioning there. So we would be outside from all day with the students just marching around, making sure they got the formations right. Because then on the actual sports day, parents would come to watch and they would all march around with their flags. So they'd come up with cheers. They'd come up with coordinated dances. Um, there would be a couple of events that teachers would also participate in, but it was a huge, huge thing and people got really into it. And it was also if the kids got in trouble, there was a lot of discuss. like, there was a lot of practicing of marching. We had to like go back out if they weren't marching correctly. So things get, are pretty rigid in Japanese high schools. Obviously some stuff has changed. It's been a couple of years since I've been there, but it, it's going to change a little bit from year to year. <laughs> we also had the, the class walk, which is where we just walked to the beach and we just chilled there all day and just played silly games like jump rope and just like silly beach racing games. Um, and then marathon day was a track and field day where the students, we went to a really nice park with a track and we just ran and we ate lunch outside and then we all walked back to the school together. And then obviously graduation, graduation is graduation. It's pretty similar. People get their diplomas um, and then they get them, they walk around the school and pose and take pictures with everyone around them and say really sad things and crying and then they get to leave. So when do they actually, what age do they start school? So they start school in, pre, uh, in first grade. So most students start in kindergarten, but kindergarten isn't part of elementary school. Um, if I'm remembering correctly. So I worked with high school students, but you can do, most people go to like daycare, which is a pre-K and then kindergarten, and then they move into elementary school. So how old are, are the students generally when they graduate? 18. So it ends up being the same amount of education, but um, it's just shifted slightly. So it's uh, let's see. So kindergarten through six and then seventh, eighth, ninth, and then 10th, 11th, 12th is high school. And compulsory education ends when a student finishes junior high. So they don't have to go to high school, but um, the majority of students do. Okay. And do they, and depending on which track that they decided to go to in high school, do they all go into, do they go all go to college and unless they're of course in like the technical and commercial track. If so in the academic track, do they go, do, do they just go to work? It, it really depends. So I worked at a commercial high school. So I wasn't at an academic high school. I was at a commercial high school and we had five tracks within our ac a commercial school. So there was like a general commercial school. There was home ec, there was bookkeeping slash accounting kind of. There was international business and I was just on their website right before. Apparently they've changed some of the tracks and they now have information systems, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, so the students would apply for a specific track, but each track had its own range of what their test score had to be. And typically if they did poorly on the entrance test, but they were still technically able to get in, they would end up in the international business class or business track. So those tended to be some of my most uh, spirited, but not necessarily academically strong students. And then based on that, they might go on to additional education. So 
the my students who were in the home ec uh, track might go on to become a nursery school teacher to get qualified in that. They might become dental hygienists. I had a number of students who went on to uh, cosmetology school to learn how to cut hair. So, so education is not considered academic, uh, like. <laughs> yes. So no, it, it's yeah. So <laughs> nur so like pre K um, is not considered. You don't need a college degree to teach that. You just need a certificate. Okay. But if you want to be like an elementary school teacher, yes, you're probably going to be in the academic high school, and you're probably going to go on to a teaching college. Okay. But for all of my other students, some of them did go on to college. It was just pretty, it, it was pretty rare, not necessarily rare. It was just definitely a smaller percentage. So some just went straight to work. Uh, some did do that sort of additional technical college level certifications. Um, it, was, it was a mix, but the majority weren't going on to prestigious colleges from my institution. And this is a picture of, the school. The school was broken into four classroom buildings. And then that big green arch that you see, that is the gym. And then you can see one of the fields. And then there are the changing rooms for some of the, the clubs. So they keep the club gear. And then further beyond that is our field. We didn't have any grass in those fields because it was too expensive to water it. So as you can see, it's mostly dirt. Um, before the color, like the big sports days, we would all as a school go out and pull out any grass or weeds that were growing there to make sure it was just completely dirt. Oh. Also, it's worth noting, my school was 100 years old when I was working there. So I was there for the 100 year anniversary and it, it felt like it. We didn't have AC, we didn't have heating. Um, there, we had fans, um, but it often would get so humid we had to put newspaper down so that you didn't slip on the tile. Uh, so it was definitely a huge change for me. Um, yeah, so it it was fun. We had kerosene heaters in some of the rooms and we had, um, it, it was definitely a lot. It, it wasn't necessarily rural, but it was definitely different than I was used to growing up in the Midwest. Wow, okay. So you, your built your school was actually in existence before World War II. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's like probably even into like World War One. You know, it's that it was before then. Yeah, and actually, so I was in subsidized teachers' housing when I was living there. That was from I want to say the '30s. It was it was condemned right after I moved out just to give you an idea of sort of how the city is functioning. There are some newer things, but yes. Okay. Also on a note, just about the high schools, high schoolers. So you can see that my students had uniforms. Uniforms are standard in Japanese high schools. Right. There's typically a couple different pieces of the uniform. So you'll have like a winter set, a summer set, and then some transition pieces. And then you'll have a winter and summer set of, of gym clothes too. But you can't wear outside shoes inside. So all of the students would also have these like cheap plastic slippers that they wore inside the building that were color coded according to grade. So it would be very easy if you knew the color to tell what grade each person was. Um, this also was really easy to identify them when they were sneaking out of class and they were going across the street to the convenience store for lunch, which they weren't allowed to leave campus for lunch. Their names were typically written on their, their sandals or on their slides. So it was very clear to see. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, any questions about high school or uniforms at all? No, cool. So let's speak Nihongo. I'll put mm -hmm. it in your desk. This will, this will be cringe, just enjoy this. Um, so <laughs> some basic words that are gonna be really beneficial. So I tried my best to write these out as phonetically and like painfully easy as I could in the middle. And then the Japanese obviously is on the right. If you've been learning any kind of hiragana. So there's three alphabets in Japanese. Hiragana, you're gonna see sort of the swirly, the rounder edges, that's hiragana. Katakana is very sharp and very blocky looking. 
that tends to be for foreign borrowed words. Like, for example, um, every morning I would drink hohi. So that might be, can you guess what that one is? Coffee. Coffee, great. <laughs> uh, I might want to get a burger from Macudonaldo. McDonald's. <laughs> That's McDonald's. <laughs> uh, in the summer, we eat ice cream. Ice cream. Oh. <laughs> ice cream. Oh. Ice, ice cream. <laughs> exactly. Or uh, my least favorite one to try and say. Um, I once went on vacation to Australia. Australia. <laughs> yep. Australia. 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 One thing to note about the Japanese language is there is no distinct R or L. They are the same sound in the Japanese language. So where we say R's sort of towards the front of your mouth, if you think about it, so try saying R, 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 R. R. So it's going to be a little bit forward in your mouth. If you want to say the Japanese RL sound, you push it back a little bit so it becomes da. 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 So, so it's all a little bit pushed back in your mouth. Exactly. So similarly, there's no B and V. There's combined. So it, when I was feeling particularly mean, I would try and get my coworkers to say Beverly because it turns into this weird garbled mess of them all being the same sound. Uh, another fun one is squirrel. 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 It tends to be the sound. Or be 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 tends to be the sound. I get my P's and my V's and my P, my B, B and P's mixed up. I'm Filipino, so mm -hmm. my P's and F's get confused. Like I confuse those automatically anyhow on a regular basis, and my B's and V's. Okay, so similar with the B's and V's. Yes. So I, so, I have an issue still, and I've been in the States for over 30 years. It's a hard one to do, especially when you're not used to making those as distinct sounds. So I was, I would coach a lot of my students because they, we did speech contests in English. And so that was always a really hard thing to get them to even hear is the difference between the two sounds because they sound like the same in their mind. Sometimes this can be an issue, like when they're trying to say the word clap. So when they say clap, it instead sounds often like an R. Yeah. <laughs> Crap. 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 So one example was that there was there was a sentence where I won't say it how they said it, but the sentence was we sat quietly and clapped our hands. <laughs> we sat quietly and clapped our hands. There's also so it turns into that quiet quietly 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 and crapped our hands. We crapped our hands. <laughs> 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 Betty's over there shaking her head. <laughs> so just be aware if you hear someone saying something that uh, sounds rude to you, it's probably because they're just having some troubles with the R's and the L's. And likewise, you might need to say those letters especially slowly. But uh, let's learn some just basic Japanese or Nihongo. So we'll start with good morning, if you want to repeat. So it's Ohio. 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 Ohio, that is good morning. Ohio. 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 We are Konnichiwa. <laughs> right now. So next is Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. Which, which you've probably heard a lot. So that's good afternoon or it's a more formal hello. So regardless of the time of day, you can use Konnichiwa and it will work well. Um, okay. Next is, is goodbye, which a version that you've probably heard a lot. But just be aware that this is often for bye, I'm never going to see you again, or goodbye, it's going to be a long time before I see you, not just like a quick between friends. So this is sayonara. 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 So sayonara is goodbye for a long time. Sayonara. What I tended to say, sayonara. Sayonara. So where's the emphasis? 
Side, side, hold on. Side, don't, mm, one sec. Sometimes it's hard when you're breaking it down. Sayonara. So it's sayonara. Sayonara. So it'll be in the yo. Sayonara. 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 Yes. Yes. Also important to note, so I'm doing this without realizing it. So uh, a lot of Japanese is not actually words, but sounds. So for example, yes is mm, sometimes. So more informally, if someone says something else, we're like, mm, 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 mm. versus no, which is mm, or mm. No. So if you hear that humming noise, it's an actual word in Japanese. Okay. Hmm. Um, I'm learning so, Korean, so I do I, I do recognize a lot of the mm, yay. <laughs> and what's interesting is Korean sounds a lot like Japanese. So often when I'm listening to Korean, it sounds like someone's just like saying Japanese just a little bit off. Yeah. Uh, so the more casual goodbye is Janet. 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 See you later. Or just. Janet. So yes is hi. 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 Or correct. Hi. Hi. No is e yet. E yet. E yet. Um, excuse me, this will be a really useful one to say because in Japan, you say it a lot, regardless of if you're at fault or not, but it is a, just a super easy word to use, which is sumimasen. 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 It goes up and down. Sumimasen. 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 Also, Important to note on intonation, I speak like um, someone from Miyazaki a little bit now. So I, where I used to live, I, it kind of infected my Japanese. If you can say it pretty flat, that's great. A lot of Japanese is pretty flat. Okay. Uh, where I lived, it, there was a lot of intonation. So, which is also easier for us as Americans because we use so much intonation. So sometimes it's easier. So sumimasen. Sumimasen. So if you can put the emphasis more on the su, sumimasen, it turns a little bit more fluid. Sumimasen. 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 So the last one on this slide is arigato. 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 Arigato gozaimasu. Mm, arigato It's the more formal version. Yeah. <laughs> I say that to my virtual Zumba participants because I have a bunch. I have a bunch that are Japanese living in Hawaii and in Japan. So I say that to them at the end of class. Arigato gozaimasu. A lot. That's, that's great. I mean, that, that's very good. Um, we often... At the end of the day, before I left, I would have to leave the teacher's room and I'd say, um, thank you all for your hard work in Japanese. It's just something that you typically say before if you're leaving before everyone else. So I would like turn around, I'd say, um, please excuse me for leaving before you. Um, my mind is completely blinking, but I'd also say thank you for your hard work. It'll pop back into my brain when we're talking about something else. But so here are some basic words that are just useful for you. So now we're going to step up the level to this. Oh, oh no, I didn't. So I apologize. It looks like I forgot to fill out the rest of the first one. But it is ego o hanasemasta. So, ego ho o hane hane mas se maska se maska. Ego o hana se maska. Ego 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 o hana se maska. You can also, if you're in a pinch, you can also just say ego, and just look a little confused, and then English. <laughs> oh, English also works. If you just say English, English, and then they'll they'll typically say, oh no 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 English, or they'll say they'll pull you to someone who can help. Ego English. 
<laughs> just English. <laughs> also, looking sad and confused helps a lot in Japan. People are very, very nice and they will often go out of their way to help you. I have had police escort me on a five minute walk just to make sure I got to the right place. Um, people really want to help and they often really want you to have a good experience of their city. It's very important. There's a lot of pride in making sure that you had a good experience in the city. So if you need help, people will go above and beyond. You might end up in an old lady's tea shop getting free tea just because you smiled at her correctly. Um, I, there's been just, just like non-threateningly, just like <laughs> sweetly, just like, <laughs> there's not like a secret smile, just like, just like, also, if you say just even a, a tiny amount of even bad Japanese goes a really long way. They are always really, so unlike some countries, they really appreciate it when you try. So even if it's just a quick arigato, they'll typically smile and thank you a lot. <laughs> it's true. I mean, I only say konnichiwa uh, in, in my virtual classes and arigato, and they, they, they're so appreciative of it. Well, I think it's <laughs> so I, I just did, I remember, thank you for the hard work, which is otsukare sama deshita, which is thank you for your hard work. So I typically, like if I'm doing a panel about jet, once we're all done, I'll just say quickly otsukare sama deshita, which is basically you look tired, but it, it, ter it translates culturally to thank you for your hard work. You put in a lot of energy. Otsukare sama deshita. Otsukare sama deshita. So next is a long one. I don't expect you to like memorize these. I'll, you have the deck so that you can look at these later. You can also Google these. I'm not the authority on this, but so this is all definitely out there, but just so that you can hear it. The next one is, I only speak a little Japanese. Watashi wa. Watashi wa. Nihongo. Nihongo ga. Nihongo ga. Tsukoshi. Tsukoshi. Shika. Shika. Hana se masen. Hana se masen. So it turns into Watashi wa Nihongo Skoshi Shika Hana se masen. I can only speak a little Japanese. Nihongo ga Skoshi Shika Hana se masen. Excellent. <laughs> um, so another useful one is what's your name? So it is Onamai wa. Onamai wa. Nan. Deska. Deska. Onamae wa nan deska. Deska. Uh, so next is my name is blah blah. So instead of like in English when we would use a dot 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 to indicate like fill in the blank here, you'll often see just the big circles. Um, and also instead of blah blah blah, it's nani nani nani, which is just like what 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 or doko doko doko, which is just where, 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 where. Nani, nani, nani. So in this, nani, nani. So often if you're just like, yeah, and then nani, nani, nani. Nani, nani. So in this case, my name is Watashi no. Watashi no. Uh, nam namae wa. Namae wa. Cherry bell. Desu. Nani, nani. Desu. Desu. Exactly. So, for example, watashi no namae wa jodi desu. Um, also, in Japan, they often they do use the order of their name is switched, and you typically call someone by their last name unless you are close friends. Um, however, as foreigners, they often will call you by your first name because you're, they're not expecting you to adhere to that naming convention. Uh, so, I was Jody. I was Jody Sun often, or just Jody. Uh, but if my students wanted something from me, then it was Jody Sensei. It was Jody Teacher at that point. If they really wanted to kind of get my favor, 
but yep. everyone else is going to be san, which is Mr. or Mrs. or sensei, which is teacher. So you will be the san. 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 Exactly. Dian san. Dian san. Dian san. <laughs> I'm Cherry Bell san. <laughs> sensei. <laughs> yes. So I was. Jodi san or Jodi sensei, or if they didn't know me, Dobinsky sensei. Dobinsky. I, I, I did get lucky in that my name is pretty easy to say in Japanese, but there are some people who have to sort of tweak their name so that their students can say it. Nikos. She's Nichols. <laughs> Nikos. Nikos. <laughs> Nikos. 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 I'm going to have to write that down. Hold on. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> or um, another example, my partner's name is Kenneth. And so his name turns in Kenneth. Kenneth. Because there's no TH sound. Nicole. What she say? Nicole. 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 Or Nicole. 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 Baker son. Baker son. <laughs> Baker is pretty easy. Baker son. Baker son. Baker son. So the the last one is where is blah blah blah. So doko doko where is or doko doko is the where where. Wa doko desu ka. Wa doko desu ka. Yes. So. so Toilet wa doko desu ka? Wa doko desu ka? Um, How do you say toilet in Japanese, in Nihon? It, it's toire, but if you also say toireto, that yeah. also is work. So I would typically say toireto. Toireto wa, wa doko desu ka? Yeah. Um, 7-Eleven wa doko desu ka? Um, if so, another one that you might want is the combini or convenience store. Combini, combini, combini. It's a convenience store. Yep. Combini what what the do desuka. Exactly. Um. So, just because checking the time very quickly, just being a respectful visitor. So I know you you have a lot of time to prepare for this. And I, I know the other jet who's talking to you will definitely go over this, but some things just to think about, uh, try and speak Japanese. Like I said, any amount of Japanese, people will go above and beyond to try and help you, uh, especially with like little old ladies, they will love you immediately and sort of adopt you for a second if you if you try and speak some Japanese with them. Be careful about noise. Um, this is something that I know a lot of international visitors don't think about. So things like don't talk loudly on the train. You can talk, it's not gonna be silent in there, but just be aware of the noises you're making. Same as when you're trying to be on a train with the Metro here, don't have your headphones off, blasting music. Um, just kind of observe what everyone around you is doing and try and match that level if you can. Uh, last one here, shoes. So, there's going to be a lot of times when you go into temples, maybe even some restaurants, just other spaces where you can't have your indoor, your outdoor shoes on. If you have to change shoes, often there's going to be like shoe lockers for you to put your shoes in, or you're just going to be expected to walk around in your socks, um, or they might have slippers for you. So just notice when there's a change. Often the change is very clear because you have to go up a level. There'll be like a little step. And so that means typically take off your shoes or you might be going from wood to concrete, which means it's time to put your shoes back on. So there's a lot of these environmental signals. There will also typically be, especially if you're in tourist areas, there'll be big signs that say, do not walk here in shoes, no shoes allowed. But, this will happen, go ahead. But the question is they will have like slippers for you to put on or you walk Sometimes. in your shoes or your it, socks. It, it depends. So um, if you're going into a hotel room where you can't have your shoes on or they don't want you to, they'll have slippers. But if you're going to visit a temple, oftentimes they will just have you wear, walk around in your socks. So that's something I always tell my friends when they're going to Japan is make sure you're packing nice socks. They don't have to be like high quality, but like 
make sure you're you're packing socks that don't have holes in them because I guess like some of us will actually be wearing sandals and stuff like that right. to pack socks in the backpack. That's a good idea. Or even if you you can bring your own indoor slippers. Uh, I was thinking like the little grippy ones. Yeah. I mean that's that's a great idea. Or um when my when my dad visited me while I was living in Japan, I told him to bring just like a pair of slides so that he could wear those when we visited my school because my school you couldn't wear outdoor shoes inside and the visitor slippers were really uncomfortable and they just didn't fit well. That's so right. and if we're if we're on something that's tile, I'm just thinking just to make sure. <laughs> No one yeah, <laughs> more than likely you won't be walking in your socks on tile. I, more than likely that's not going to be an issue for you. Typically, if you're going to be in socks, it's going to be at a temple or some um, or a castle visit. Often those those were the times that I've had to do it. Um, outdoors, like where there's leaves and stuff, you're going to be in shoes. And if it's there's not typically tile or other really slick surfaces inside the old traditional buildings. I'm just thinking. Yeah, no, it, it's a great thing to think of. I also have um, folding slippers that I would sometimes bring with me. Also, my indoor shoes were just a pair of pumps that I never wore outside. So indoor shoes is a loose definition. You can also always pick stuff up there. The Daiso, which is the dollar store there, will have everything you need and more. Okay. Uh, yeah, last thing is just you, you have a year to repair. So think about how you really want to make the most of your trip. Um, I really suggest keeping a journal if that's a blog, if that's um, you're just taking pictures and writing notes, or if it's a physical journal, there is something nice about having a physical journal that you can then look through later, but also set goals. That's always how I made sure that I, even when I was taking little trips, it's good that you can be like, well, it rained all day and everything was closed and I feel gross, but I did finally get to eat this one thing in Hiroshima that I was really excited about. So it still makes it makes you feel accomplished and it makes it feel less like just a sort of a tourist trip and also like, hey, I did something out of my comfort zone. So that is all I have. Um, I've got 15 minutes and I'm going to stop sharing so I can be a little bit better. Uh, but does anyone have questions for me? I, I've lost you again. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you are fine go ahead Wait. yeah i've i've lost you okay let me share my screen again and see if that helps there i, I okay see you now but i like i don't know what is going on but you just disappeared okay but you um, can see me yes we can see you great <laughs> okay so any any questions or anything else you want me to go over? No, this was this was good. Thank you so much. So I'm thank here. you for having me. <laughs> um, I, I, I I teach English in the high school here. So so you have actually uh, three of our chaperones on our trip that we're that are going. So Betty is one of our chaperones. Dion is my second, and I'm lead. I'm the lead group leader on this trip. And it's basically us, just us finding out as much as possible about Japan and maybe something that we we have not learned already with our 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 gen alum Michael. So in in all reality, everything that you've talked about today, we have not discussed yet in any of our sessions with Michael, other than maybe some of the beginning uh, some, some of the beginning expressions so far. So. I mean, I've always wondered about the school setting, mainly because I see it all the time in the, the Japanese dramas and movies that I watch. So it's just like, okay, I know that everybody wears uniforms. I know about the uh, the, the slippers and stuff like that because I, I watch so much Asian dramas. Mm -hmm. But just the, the simple fact that it's kind of set up like... Um, the Latin American and Spanish schools where after ninth grade, they can choose to go to high school on a specific track or not, because I taught Spanish and that is one of the things that I, I teach the students in the Spanish class is that this is what happens. It's like after ninth grade, you can choose whatever you wanna do. So if you wanna go to university, you can go on to high school and follow that track. But I didn't know that there was specific colleges or tracks that you have just already at the high school level there. 
So um, just on that, are schools, pri they're all private in Japan or are they public? So the majority are public. So I worked at a public school. Um, all there, these, all the ones that I mentioned are, there are private schools, but there are just a wide range of public schools. Mm -hmm. um, and so education, there's no tuition, but you still have to be able to afford the school uniform. So typically that's going to be the most expensive purchase, but you will also have that for all four years or three years, excuse me. And I think, so most of my students, you'd see the first year students in these like wildly oversized jackets. Um, but the, the thought that they will then be growing into them over the next three years. So typically there'd be, um, I think two sets, two full, so they'd have one set, full set of each, and then they'd have like a couple extra shirts and maybe an extra skirt or pair of pants. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Do you have any questions? Betty, do you have any questions? I'd like to know about the pricing comparisons. Like, what is it in general? Like price, for example, of a soda. Does give me a comparison or price of a bottle of water, uh, things like that. If they are related to our prices or they are considerable more expensive or what is it? Absolutely. So, um, price of a soda would be like 120, 150 yen. So, um, when I was there, it was roughly 100 yen to a dollar. It's gone down a little bit. So, that would probably be closer to a dollar for a soda. Um, some things are more expensive though. So produce, non-local produce was a lot more expensive comparatively, but things that were grown locally were pretty cheap. Um, also fish was a lot cheaper in Japan, but things like beef were incredibly expensive, especially if I wanted to get the local beef, I would only get it when there was a sale. Um, but there also are very expensive gift fruits. So, um, my, my prefecture was known for our mangoes. And so one of these really nice mangoes might be $20. And so that was actually, someone got me that as a goodbye present when I was leaving. I got a mango. <laughs> That's expensive mango. That's nice it's expensive, but also, so I, I, also the rent varies wildly because, I mean, just like it does in the US. Um, in Tokyo, so I was paying for my, for my apartment that got condemned after I left, I was paying a little under a hundred dollars a month for it. And it was uh, three rooms. I had two rooms with reed flooring. So it's Tommy and then one Western room with like vinyl flooring. But I also only had hot water in the bathtub and no hot water in the kitchen. And I didn't have like central heat or anything. And I had baths and I had mice and it was a whole thing. Uh, but then I moved into my new apartment, which was a two bedroom with like a very nice living room and like an automatically filling bathtub. And that was a little under $400 a month. Okay. So but, what was the size comparison between the two, two apartments? It, it wasn't significantly smaller. So my first apartment was a 3K, which is three rooms and a kitchen. Um, and the rooms in Japan are measured based on their tatami or the mat sizes, because a tatami is a standard size. So I had um, a four tatami room as my bedroom and a six tatami room as sort of my extra bedroom, but my, what I used as my living space. And then the Western room was four tatami and the kitchen was pretty small. My second apartment was a two LK, which was two rooms, two bedrooms, a living space and the kitchen. Um, living space, so it, it, living space and the kitchen were sort of one big room. Um, yeah, it, it was a little bit smaller, but it was, I was the first person to live in it. So it was significantly newer and it had the more modern features like the heated toilet seat and my bathtub that filled up on a timer and announced when it was ready. Um, <laughs> a heated toilet seat. <laughs> yeah. So be also be prepared for that. It won't be as much of an issue in August, but you will be able to turn it on. So because Japan doesn't have the central heat, um, heated toilet seats really help. 
Um, <laughs> so for example, like I didn't have heating in my apartment. Uh, so I like the bathroom was very cold. So you turn that on and you have that on and it, it's easier, especially as a woman, it's a lot easier to deal with the bathroom in the winter. <laughs> um, and my tub, I could set it at a timer and say, okay, when I get home from drumming practice, I want it to be full. I want it to be this hot, go. And so it would be waiting for me as I got oh to the door. <laughs> so you can run a bath on the timer? <laughs> yeah, and it would It would also, it had a reheater on it. So it would suck in water and keep it hot. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> I also had an intercom in my bathroom and my kitchen. And so when my bathtub was finished, it would announce that my bathtub was finished. <laughs> and I would often forget that that was happening. I'd be like silent in my apartment and a, a Japanese robotic lady would tell me that my bathtub was ready and I'd like fall wow. out of my chair. <laughs> so okay, my son is very jealous. <laughs> but also, so there, there was that, but on the other end of the spectrum, my students had no idea how to use a USB drive. We were still using um, fax machines. Yeah. The, all my students had CD players. Yeah. So it's, it, it was a wide range. We didn't have Wi-Fi at the school. And then we finally got it my last year and it didn't work. Um, <laughs> so Japan is a really interesting mix of high technology and still very low technology, yeah. especially wow. out of places like Tokyo. It's like Tokyo is to Japan, like New York is to the rest of the US. It's, it's its own thing. I don't even know if you can call Tokyo Japan because it's it's its own little country. Right. It's its own its own culture. It's its own culture. And Tokyo isn't just a city. It is actually a whole bunch of cities together. So each ward has sort of a different personality and a main uh, focus. So like you have like a, a, a fashion ward and you have the like technology ward where you can get a lot of video games and you can get some old technology if you're into like finding old gaming systems. Akihabara is the place to go. It also has huge like multi-level arcades. We actually uh, Sega are has Akihabara. That's excellent. I I'm it, it was I'm not a fan of Tokyo personally just because so I have ADHD so it's incredibly mm -hmm. overstimulating for me in Tokyo. But Akihabara was super cool. Um, there's also some really nice parks in Tokyo that are just nice for like a little bit of a break if you get a little overstimulated. Um, yeah, it, it's just a really fun place to visit. Okay. So, all right. Thank you for joining us today and giving us this short talk. Um, Absolutely. I'd say let's let's do it again with a different topic, but <laughs> only if you have. Time. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm always happy to talk about Japan. I really, I clearly like talking about it and it, it's always gonna be my second home. So if I can make it easier and make people, help people have a trip that's more meaningful and less just sort of surface level, I'm right. all about that. That's what my master's degree is in, what I like to do. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, if you want to, me to put together something in the future, I'm absolutely happy to do that. Um, but I have to hop off for another meeting. So it was really right. lovely talking to you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day.